I was always bottom of grammar school. And as I say, I, the, the headmaster pulled me in after the fifth year and said, you know, you don't really want to be here. By this point, I'd started taking drugs. I was playing guitar in a band. And that was my sort of awakening, really, was music. And I, I know that sounds like, oh, everyone has that. But for me, it, it allowed me to be with the cool guys. Up until music, I was not one of the cool guys. So music and, and smoking very bad hash, which was all we could get in those days. And um, that was my, 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 my passport to being a little bit cool. But then I was lucky, very lucky to get my first job at the studio. And, um, and How I did you just, land it? Oh, well, I was at the right place at the right time. I managed to, 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 to fiddle a trip to the studio and my boss, I said to him, any jobs going, you know, and he goes, well, funnily enough, there's a, one of our assistants, one of our two assistants just handed in his notice this morning. So come back next week and I'll give you a, you know, and we'll have a real um, interview. I came back the following week and, uh, and he just liked, you know, he never tried anything on me or anything and nothing like that. But but it was, um, you know, my enthusiasm again. And I, I but but for the I'd just taken my my O level results hadn't come through yet. But the, the, the requirement for the job was was physics O level. Now, technically, when I said my my results hadn't come through in the interview, I knew that in my physics and chemistry, which I took combined, I literally signed my name and walked out after 15 minutes. <laughs> Honestly, I literally I did that. I and uh, so, so I didn't technically lie when I said, well, I'm sure I passed, but my results haven't come through yet. And he said, okay, we'll give you a three month trial period. And of course, my results came in, I got a double F or whatever the lowest <laughs> is, but it didn't matter because I was already like, would you like another cup of tea? Would you like this? Would you like that? You know, but just to tell you, Warren, it was in the days, it was the last studio on the planet that had a separate machine room, right? So you had three rooms. You had the studio, you had the control room, and you had the imaginatively titled Room B, which was where <laughs> I sat. <laughs> with uh, with 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 the with the twenty four track and the the two tracks and the and the patch bay this huge toggle patch bay that the only way the tape could be started was there was a swan neck microphone on the mixing desk which came to a sort of oratone next to my ear and I had uh, and I had a little volume control so I could turn it up or down and basically it was like okay record I'd press the buttons and record. A, a punch in, a drop in was called a cue to press. So they would say cue to press from second chorus or whatever. So I would go back to 10 seconds before the second chorus and wait. And they said, OK, and I'd press play. And the, the, like the, the producer would say to the engine now and the engineer would say press and I would press. So I became and, and literally if I wasn't at my station, no, the, the, the music, there was no remote on the desk, you know, it was horrendous. But I became, you know, the fastest tape op in the West because I would hear the music and I would go, OK, I think they want to do the second verse again. So at the end of the take, I would go back to just before the second verse and the, and the producer would say to the engineer, could we do the second verse again? I go, boom. You know, it was like I was it was like. I could have done the, 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 the least, but I was so enthusiastic. I wanted to be really good at that, you know. But, um, but, but what happened was, is that I was never, I never knew what happened in the control room because I was never even allowed to go in. I was never, I had a talk back, but I was told never to talk back. You know, so I, it was like the loneliness of the long distance runner. I would get the occasional roadie coming in to give me a joint or, you know, some speed or something like that. <laughs> and um, and I would press my buttons. So at weekends, because, you know, it was, I was, I came up from recording studio culture, which basically means, you know, you go from assistant to engineer and, you know, and you 
because when you hired the studio, it came with an engineer in those days. So I, um, at weekends, if the, if the studio was empty, I was allowed to bring in my own project to, to practice engineering and I would run, you know, I would, I would try and get a sound and then run into room B, press record, <laughs> you know, and then run back and try and do that until like the drummer said, Steve, I can do that job. Just tell me, I'll go and sit in the other room and I'll be the tape op. <laughs> and and that's, um, and actually that drummer's name was Warren because it was a band called Ultravox. Of course. Uh, it was the original Ultravox before Mr. Mid Ewer. Some Ultravox fans would say that this was, it, they had a singer called John Fox and it was a lot more like, like a punk rock, Roxy music. And in fact, I did their demos and from those demos, they got signed to Island Records. Now Island Records said, who do you want to be a producer? And they said, well, we like working with Steve. And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, who's Steve Lillywhite? You need to have someone else. And they said, well, you know, we love Roxy Music. Can you get Brian Eno? So that was the first time I met Brian in 1978, something like that. Uh, and, and if you've ever worked with Brian, I don't know if you know him, he's not one of those in the studio all the time, guys. He's far too intelligent for micromanaging. You know, he'll come in, he'll do his Brian-ness, and then he'll go. So we did the first Ultravox album, and uh, and he was great. I, you know, and the next time I met Brian, actually, was on the Joshua Tree, about six years later, eight years later. I, I can't. God, I don't. Thank God for Wikipedia, Warren. Thank <laughs> yeah, God for I'll Wikipedia. I'll scroll back. Um, so my first production credit was produced by Brian Eno, Ultravox, and Steve Lillywhite, engineered by Steve Lillywhite. And it was great. They were a great band. And uh, and I did, I still, I did a song there called Young Savage, which was probably the fastest record ever made. Now, I, I would like to... to, to uh, it was why it was almost the it was certainly the fastest song I've ever produced, and it's and it's still you know it still sounds pretty good today. But there you go. I'm looking here. I see. I see you credited on Ultravox Excamation. Yes, I think that was their was that their first album. Yeah, their second album was called Ha Ha Ha. Yeah, and I think that Young Savage was a a, a a standalone single that was then tagged on to the second album because. In those days, you didn't even need to have your hit single on the album. Because I, I after the Ultravox album, my uh, roommate at the time was knew a guy called Johnny Thunders. And Johnny Thunders had just moved from New York with his band, The Heartbreakers. The New York Dolls had fallen apart. He moved to London to try and make it. And, and they had their LAMF album, it was called Like a Mother. That was released in England. They were sort of, you know, for us, they looked exotic. Johnny was this this crazy, I mean, there are, you know, he was lovely, but had his problems. And the general consensus was that the Heartbreakers album didn't sound very good. You know, so I was just, I suppose, quite pushy. And I and I got to know Johnny, but I said, and there was talk of Johnny doing a solo album. So I said, I'll do your solo album. I'd love to do it. I'll make it sound good, Johnny completely bluffing so <laughs> i eventually did this solo album and and that was we had um steve jones paul cook from the sex pistols we had phil linnett we had stevie marriott we had eddie and the hot rods play on it it was fantastic and the album was called so alone but it had one song on which is a fantastic song called you can't put your arms around a memory oh also had peter perrett from the only ones who i loved you know another girl another planet one of my Oh, yeah, favorite. amazing. A, a song that starts out with a guitar solo can't be bad. Um, <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> so, uh, so the manager of Susie and the Banshees came to the studio and heard You Can't Put Your Arms Around a Memory. He said, oh, we've just recorded our first single with an American producer. Now, I still don't know who it was, but he said, we don't like how it sounds. I knew enough at the time that if, I could deliver what the band wanted because, you know, it's all about what the, the artist must be happy with their product. You know, uh, if I could deliver what the band wanted, I would get it released. And if it was released, it would be a hit because at that point, 
you know, Susie was on the front cover of Sounds, Melody Maker, Enemy. She was the, as hot as they come. But it wasn't it wasn't a done deal because, mm -hmm. you know, the artist had to be happy with the products. I took them in and I recorded Hong Kong Garden, which you've done a wonderful piece on. Thank you um, so much. Then I had a hit. And for me, it was like, oh, my God, I've got a hit. Everything changes because you, I, I suppose you can look at having a hit in two different ways. And this is only after the event with a little bit of wisdom and grace. You can either go, I had a hit, aren't I great? Or you can go, I had a hit, I can choose only great artists to work with. You know, and for me, it's like, well, that's a, I'm a no, that's a no brainer. I'm fucking useless. <laughs> you know, so why do I think that I can, you know, I, I absolutely don't think I'm great whatsoever, but I've had a hit. <laughs> and once you've had a hit, you can, you are in charge of your own destiny because you can, you can use that hit to, 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 you know, each hit grows this sort of organism, you know? So I basically, I, I, and, and it was through fear out it was the fear of knowing i was no good and that i was an imposter because nothing from my childhood had ever given me any confidence that i was any good i wasn't even the best tape hop at my studio my great friend who has subsequently passed called steve brown and we were known as the two steves who he then produced wham and the cult he was a he was my best friend and i was best man at his wedding he was best man at mine but yeah, so, so I wasn't even the best tape op at the studio. So I, I had no credentials to make myself and with a stupid name, <laughs> but I had a hit. So, you know, from that moment on, I thought, yes, but at least it made me think that someone, you know, so I then, you know, did a couple of other. Well, you must have records. done something right. Let's pause for a second, because that's yeah. a, that track sounds freaking phenomenal even today. It still sounds good today, right? I, I recorded the drums separately. I just yep. recorded the, the the bass drum and the snare because, you know, I not that I want that I could get much ambience out of the room, but it was it was more like he was, you know, that drummer was only the drummer for the I think the either the first one or the first two it albums. Was the first two, yeah. Kenny Morris, uh, you know, he was not really a musician; he was an art student. And uh, him and John Mackay, they left the band. I mean, that was quite, you know, they left just before a tour. Without dwelling too much on that song, because we've got so much to talk about, but the song's such a masterpiece. It's just G and F. It's just yeah. two chords. And yet it's so inventive. It's so, what just a power trio can do, you know, just guitar, bass and drums. So oh. many interesting ideas going on with two chords. Yeah, and some very random bass notes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Eight bass notes that shouldn't really be, you know, because Severin also, Severin wasn't much of a musician. He chose the notes that sounded cool. He didn't choose the correct notes. Yeah. And, you know, as, as we all know, a little bit of knowledge can be a bad thing. So that was a great time because they had no knowledge. I mean, in, in a way, it, it, it had slight echoes of early U2. In, in the structure of the band, because it had a, a sort of scientist who was the guitar player. It had uh, a drummer who was not brilliant. And it had a bass player who was never a musician, really. And, and you know, Adam, who is one of my greatest friends, would not call himself a musician, even to this day, which is one of the reasons why you two never jam because, you know, they don't really understand the concept of jamming. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so I, that's the first time I've thought about that. Yeah, they were, they, it was very much a similar makeup of, of, uh, yeah. of, a, of a scientist guitarist, yeah. which was John. How fantastic is that? But it doesn't, you know, he was as good as the edge in those days, but he didn't have, I don't know what ever happened to him. It's something just happened. So we did the video and I could find nothing on him. And then after the video, started to get some decent views. His Wikipedia page just recently got expanded, so I feel like he must have gone back and added in some of his history. He did do some other band stuff, but I, I think he ended up doing like graphics or art stuff right. or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I think the last time I spoke to him, he said he was, and, and this was like not long after he left the band, uh, he said he was 
getting a band together. But in the meantime, he had a stall in Camden Market. It's, it's such, so many incredible guitar players at the time. Obviously, the, the Edge is a whole five-hour conversation. But um, right. John John McGeoch, do you yes, know? Yes, yes, oh. he was who you know a fantastic player, and uh, you know Stuart Adamson as well. Stuart Adamson, uh, yeah, yeah, had a lot a lot of influence and um again another guy who who who's not with us anymore and and he had a bit of a bad rap actually Stuart because in America big you know maybe because their hit single was called Big Country and the band was called Big Country and the video for that song had them on like four wheelers like like the monkeys you know they were considered like a pop band you know and and in the UK, it was they were much more, you know, you could you could group together simple minds, big country, and you too at one point. Yeah, they were more dangerous. Yeah. They were more yeah, dangerous. Yeah, along with Echo and the Bunny Man and Teardrop Explode. You know, they were all of the same scene, which was this sort of, you know, once punk had come, it had sort of veered off into the sort of uh, new romantic movement and the sort of alternative guitar based band movement. You know, on one hand, you had Duran, Duran and Spandau and all that. And on the other hand, you had um, you had U2, Big Country, Simple Minds, Teardrop, Echo, you know. And um, and I, I definitely went towards the more of the rock side. I do want to ask you, though, because because I wasn't, you know, I'm going to uh, uh, excuse me if I sound like an idiot, but I didn't know till I was scrolling through your credits while we're on the earlier side. Is this of the time? Handsworth Revolution because it has you on it has you listed maybe did, did they take a track and put it put it on there on a reissue well, or they, something? they had uh, Handsworth Revolution was the album yeah and yep. I only I did one song oh you did one song I did Ku Klux Klan which right. was the hit single um yep. no they're, they're, I'll, I'll tell you that story it's quite funny um I'm yeah, a huge I'm, fan but, of that band and that record's phenomenal yeah 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 but I was only like a day and a half so it was a tiny little thing. And, and it was Chris Blackwell. I'd, I'd left, after I did the Ultravox album, I got offered a job to go and work at Island Studios. So I went and worked for Blackwell. And I think they were in the studio. They, they, they signed to Island. And, and, and I think Blackwell felt that maybe, I mean, this is just me and, you know, he, I love Chris and, and we were, you know, he, he really believed in me. I think it was a case of, well, there are these black guys in the studio and they're quite, quite militant and stuff. Oh, so was Bob. I was the only white guy in the studio. I'll put Steve in with Steel Pulse and Godwin Logie was the great engineer. You know, the weed was particularly strong and I remember thinking I was being in the studio and smoking this weed with them and they were lovely and at one point I remember speaking to Godwin outside the studio and say Godwin I, I, I'm, I'm freaking out I am I really needed in here you know I got this like thing that I, he says yeah 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 yeah, you're doing great so you know I went back in and I I, I got some more confidence because I was out of my comfort zone but but you know I, I'd also done you know some dub you know I was I was a heavy weed smoker and had done dubs with the members and you know there was there was you know punk rock and reggae had this connection for sure you know with I mean the clash were probably the a great example of that but no I did that song Ku Klux Klan and that was it yeah, it was, it was, but it was a, a learning experience for me. Totally. Yeah, and, and honestly, every, every success I had, I, I always tried to make sure that my next uh, album that I did, I won't, I won't say project, because I always, you know, I always said <laughs> school children do projects, <laughs> I make albums, you know, and stupid thinking. But, you know, I never say the no. word project. I get it. It always it always sounds like a business transaction, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Or something that's a piece of art. art. Yeah, 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 yeah. We make records. We make art. We do, you know, we have, we try for greatness. A project isn't greatness. A project is, you know. So I would always try and not do something that sounded like the artist I had success with. Which is why very early on, I, I produced Joan Armour Trading in 1980, which was a complete... Lee uh, and Peter Gabriel and and stuff like that, which was not part of, you know, because for me, punk rock is an attitude. As an art form, it was very limited. 
you know. It's interesting. I, I want to I want to pause you on this because I think we we may have talked about this in our first kind of like chat online. What's yeah. interesting is like I I did the Susie and the Banshees song and I talked about like you know how it was like the first like big hit of post punk, and I think non UK people don't realize that punk by '78 was passe and people were twisting it up and there was all this post punk yeah. stuff coming in. And they're like, no, there were still punk bands around. I was like, yeah, but they weren't, you know, that was, the scene moved I, I, so I quickly in those. Probably like you, you know, I, I well, not like you, because I, generation ahead of you, but for me, melody is still the most important thing. You know, I grew up with the Beatles, you know, and I grew up with melody and that sort of, bay, 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 all that, you know, for me, the, the, you know, Sound of the Suburbs by the members was great but only because it had a chorus. The verse was same old boring Sunday morning, old man's out watching the, you know, I love it, but uh, I couldn't do a whole career with, with just monotonic singing, you know, and, uh, and I love, you know, my brother was in the members. So I, 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 and my best friend even now was the guitarist. So, you know, I, I love them all to death and, but yeah, so punk rock was a great attitude though. And that's still something that I hold dear to me you know, um, the attitude of, of no complacency, you know, because I think complacency in any art form ruins the art form because that's what we rebelled against in, in, in the early, set. you know, we, we rebelled against that sort of nerdling and, uh, and, and all that, you know. So XTC. It's interesting. XTC. Everybody, yeah. everybody I've talked to about XTC sort of, puts them as one of their favorite records they've made was with XTC, whether it was a successful album or not. Uh, do you feel similarly about the guys and everything? Absolutely. And, and those were the days when God knows what Richard Branson put in the small print, but none of us made any fucking money. <laughs> you know, um, no, it was, you know, I mean, you speak to Andy Partridge now. He should be, he's one of the greatest artists ever. No argument you know, from me. And, and everyone signed bad deals in those days. But those early Virgin contracts were particularly vicious and anti-artist friendly, you know. Now, a lot of artists since those days, if they've remained successful, they make up with the shortfall with, um, with touring, you know. And, of course, Andy never did that. Yeah. So yeah. he, you know, he, he lives in Swindon still and uh he he you know he's king of his own small world you know and and it was very much like that when i worked with them they even though they were fantastic they still had this we come from the you know we come from swindon and we're not really very hip and you know um and it's like you make some of the best music in the world you know but you're still this sort of oh apologizing from for coming from swindon you know Everyone comes from somewhere. Get over it. Doesn't matter, you know. But um, but no. It, and those were easy records to make because they were really good players. They came in the studio with all the lyrics finished, all the the parts nicely. There was never a moment when the two guitarists played the same thing. Very important. There was not a barely a power chord in sight. It was lean, you know, because a power chord is just. Basically, for me, a power chord is laziness. Now, that's sort of controversial in itself, but sure, but, no, but I know, understand. I know, I know the but, point but, you're making. You know, square power chords on every every four every bar in the chorus for me is not art. You know, you can get that power from something else. So I re rarely, rarely listen to you know, and especially when two guitarists are doing it. It's just look. There's many many successful bands who do that. So I just for me, I don't think my discography, you know, for instance, take the edge. The edge has only ever written one song with power chords because <laughs> he because he thinks there's probably only one song left to be written with power chords. And that was Vertigo. <laughs> and that was Vertigo, you know, and that's the only song he's ever written with power chords. Yeah, no, no power chords. Yeah. Mean every part was 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 worked out. You know, we worked in a great studio. That was the first time I worked with Hugh Padgham. So we were, you know, I was, the, the, the sounds that I'd been experimenting with on the scream, on, 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 and Johnny Thunders and all these earlier things, all of a sudden I was in a better studio. 
with a better engineer so we could push those ideas forwards. And of course, then Peter Gabriel pushed it even more. Yeah, exciting times, you know, and, and as I say, you know, the, the, both XTC albums, the uh, Drums and Wires and Black Sea, they were both, you know, I think probably two weeks recording, two weeks overdubbing, two weeks mixing. You know, so it was, uh, it was, and then the band went off. You know, I just remember happy times and um, unlike, say, a U2 album where, where there were no lyrics, there was no, you know, it was all untogether. The studio was shit. Yeah. God, so many problems. <laughs> With XTC, there was absolutely no problems. You know, when I was 14, I was into prog rock and that was my thing. And then, Me too. you know, punk, you know, that was, uh, I loved these crazy English folk rock there was a band called Stackridge, and uh, you know this was before your time, but um, no, but I, no. I know all that stuff. Like I, my dad used to, you, you know, we had Steel Ice Band, we had those right. records, and and I had a massive prog rock phase. I love early Genesis, Nursery Crimes, great album. Yeah, I love, all, yeah, to be honest, yeah. I love all Genesis. I like because they're great songwriters, you know. Yeah, 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 and and you know Phil was very clever. Yeah, Phil yep. just came along and and took everything that Peter had been like screwing his brain around to get oh well, he just like oh i'll have a bit of that i'll have a bit of that and i'll in about a tenth of the time i'll make a record that is uh you know yeah it's great well yeah but for- melt is uh you know gabriel three melt is like in my yeah. top five favorite albums of all time though yeah i think it's i listened to it the other day and it was funnily enough it's such a dark album and it was so full of joy when we made it you know, my memories of that album are completely the opposite of my rea- of when you listen to it. You know, we were happy. We were, uh, we were uh, large amounts of table tennis. You know, I was probably the, the, the champion. I could beat Hugh and I could beat Peter, you know. And so there was some just general youth club. It was like a youth club. As everyone knows, when you're in your, you know, a three-year age gap even, between the age of, I was 25 and Peter was 28, but that felt huge. You know, <laughs> Hugh was 25, I, I, Hugh's the same age as me. He was definitely from another era and he was like, we thought of him as being old, older than <laughs> us. But I think he's only, I, I don't know, how old is Peter Gabriel now? I think he's, I think he's like 69. I think he's 69, like 69. So, yeah. Yeah, 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 four years. Yeah, for 66. No, three years older than me. Yeah. 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 No, it's ridiculous. When they did uh, the first Genesis album, he was a teenager. He was probably, yeah. he may still have been at school. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of them were, you know, look at Stevie Winwood. Yeah. You know, keep on running when he was 15. Yeah. Uh, insane. Yeah. yeah Andy Fraser. Andy Fraser, Andy Fraser yeah. was 15 when uh, Free got signed on the first record, 15. Oh. <laughs> you know, you listen to that bass line of All Right Now. Yeah. With the harmonics. Oh, yeah. brilliant. Yeah. yeah, he was probably uh, 17. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, awesome. Yeah, it's, that's, it's, that's why we should let the young have music back. I agree. I agree. You know, it's funny. When I was, you know, I, I had my first, as I say, Hong Kong Garden was September 70. Eight. So I was 23. The idea of a, of a producer in their 30s was old. An idea of a producer in their 40s was unheard of. 50s, you might as well be dead. You know, so why do I think I have any right to still be doing it now? You know, I don't want to, you know, I'd rather tell stories and to be, and funnily enough, I always used to hate teaching. The, I, I, for me, it was like, well, teacher you know you know that expression those who can't teach which funnily enough my children's school in new york they had the teachers had a band and actually the name of the band was those who can't which is a great (laughs) name for a band of teachers (laughs) and um but now as i you know i realize now that if I have something to offer, it is really good. So I, I, I don't mind doing that at all because I, I do, you know, I, I sort of transcend that old thing 
with, and I've had success with, you know, all the modern equipments and stuff like that. So I can, you know, I, I have, what I, what I mean is I have something to give. And I always thought, I, it was always about me a little bit early. Well, maybe not, but I think it's, it's very important. And I always like, but I don't, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a technician as such. Whenever I give my speech or do anything like that, which I do, uh, it's, it's, you know, I try and make it enjoyable and try and make it, because I saw that Jeff Emmerich, you know, when he went round being interviewed and, you know, playing some Beatles stuff. And it was great, but it was very worthy, you know, and I, I like, because I have a show. Well, let me, let me uh, advertise my show, which I wrote my uh, advertise. a year. I, I, uh, just before COVID, I, I, I worked a, a two hour show with music, telling stories, a little bit of dad dancing and, you know, <laughs> funny stories though. And, and just, you know, a bit of sadness with Kirsty dying and, you know, and then, and I, I was coached by a guy who did comedy shows and I did one show in Jakarta where I live and it was great. You know, I, I would play a lot of music and, li but only snippets. And so people wanting more, you know, and you'd hear a little bit of this and you go, oh, I love that song. So it was great. And then I was, the plan was to do some gigs in Southeast Asia to really tighten it up and then to take it around the world. Because people, when they heard on my Twitter and Instagram that I was doing it, they go, oh, come to Dublin, come to here, come to there. So I thought, you know, I don't need to do big venues, but it'll pay for my trip. So I'll gently work my way around the world doing this much more exciting for me than going into a studio and setting up a drum kit, you know, and let the young people do that. And then COVID came. So it's still on hold, but hopefully in the next couple of years, I will be coming to a venue near you. <laughs> well, let me know. I'll make sure that we tell everybody who would want to know that that's going to happen. Thank you, Warren. Yeah, that would be good. No, that'd be fantastic. Um, it's fun. What I'm saying is it's fun. And um, yeah. Yeah, you know, I had, I had a conversation with a good friend of mine, Dave Jordan, a few years ago. Um, and he's like, Dave well, who? Jordan, who the, the guy who engineered the Rolling Stones album for me. Yes, Dave Jordan, the guy that engineered the Rolling Stones the album. The guy who I haven't spoken to since he engineered that Rolling Stones album for really? me. Really? You haven't spoken since? No. Please give him my love. I mean, I loved him. And I don't know why we never really kept in contact. Yeah, he did. That was the engineer on Dirty Work. Engineer which on I Dirty Work, say, yeah. I always say was the worst ever Rolling Stones album until the next one. <laughs> <laughs> it might have the worst cover. We'll definitely go with that. All, oh. They're all like lying there with like bright green and red. Thing oh, it was and... so 80s. So big. <laughs> so those, yeah. The 80s, we loved those big shoulder pads. <laughs> oh, my God. I used to have those big shoulder pads. <laughs> I did too. Yeah, we, we, it was, too. yeah we, we, we all had those shoulder pads. But you know what, Dave, uh, I went over to his house maybe, you know, 15, 20 years ago, and he had video cassettes of the session. Oh, my God. Yeah. So and he had this big camera. I don't know if you're remembering in film. But he filmed, and and there's cassettes, there's videos of like hour and a half Keith jamming, you know, with without Mick there, and it's yeah. just like these really long blues jams, and he just kind of goes up and he's like, "Yeah, baby, baby, yeah," and then just kind of yeah. goes back and starts. <laughs> well, I tell you, you know, uh, before I got there, uh, basically the studio. Let, let's do a quick Rolling Stones piece before the, the studio was booked from January the first. Right, in Paris, and they had it booked for three months or six months, well, however long. And of course, on January the 1st, no one arrives, or maybe a couple of roadies, and then the gear arrives, and then, you know, Keith and, and Ronnie arrive, with the first there on the 4th of January. Still no one else. So they go in the studio at midnight, right? It's a new team of people. So at midnight, Keith and Ronnie go out, and they just, like, go, like, nose to nose and are just jamming. 12 bar blues for three hours, right? So 12 <laughs> till three, at three o'clock in the morning, the engineers are starting to get a bit tired. So, so Keith and Ronnie are still wide awake. They come into the control room and go, okay, play that back. So <laughs> from three o'clock till six o'clock, the, th the two of them are in there. And by this point, the engineers are like this. And at six in the morning, Keith goes, can I have a cassette of that? <laughs> so then, 
six o'clock till nine o'clock, they had to play it again. It was. <laughs> Uh, but then the band, you know, and then the band would sort of leak in. And 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 by the time I got the call, because basically um, Mick, ja- Mick and Keith were not talking. It was well known. You know, Mick had just released his first solo album, which was affectionately known as that disco album. <laughs> you know, to Keith and Keith's guy. So I, so, so Mick spoke, so they didn't have an, en- they didn't have a producer. They just had Dave, who was like the, the, the the engineer but you know super engineer and all that but they didn't have a producer so and and because Mick and Keith were not talking they thought we need someone here you know so they basically flew into Paris maybe half a dozen people and I was recommended by Elton John El- apparently Mick had said to Elton who does bands at the moment and Elton, Elton said well Steve Lillywhite you know he's done there yeah, blah, blah. anyway so I got uh I got the call and and really, the, our interview was spend the night in the studio with the Rolling Stones. Doesn't sound like an interview. Sounds like a prize. You know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, and that's how I, I felt, you know. So we go in the... Uh, and then at six o'clock in the morning when the studio finishes, you go... Or when I, I remember arriving at the hotel and Rupert Hine had just done his night. Now, you knew, you knew Rupert, right? Not personally. I mean, he. Not he, he okay. Well, yeah, probably yeah. the idea of Rupert Hine and the Rolling Stones is probably the most, sure. you know, he was diametrically just the opposed. Nicest guy and yeah, yeah. so sensitive. Oh, just wouldn't. So, anyway, I did my night with the Rolling Stones and surprisingly, I got the job. Did you get the knife? Did Keith give you the knife? No, but the weird thing was, let me tell you, the funny thing was <laughs> on my audition night or my prize winning night, yeah. you know, I walked in, everyone had these lock knives. Yeah. Now, you know what a lock, a flick knife is you press the button and it just comes out. But a lock knife is one that you, you go like that and the, and the blade comes out. So people would here with the knife and they'd be doing, you know, well, whatever like that with the, and it just was really weird people having these knives. Two weeks into the session, I got myself one, you know, and it was like, seemed perfectly normal <laughs> having a knife. Yeah, but I, I learned a lot from them, and uh, and yeah, it had a couple of good songs on it, but really it was a, just a footnote in, in and they didn't tour it, so it was just a footnote in, in, my, in my recording career. How long were you, because I think Dave told me it was like a long album. Well, it was. Yeah, well, for him, it was three months more than me because I came in <laughs> at the end of March. The addendum to the story about from 6 a.m. till 9 a.m., can I have a cassette? So basically, they would run cassettes all the time of everything. By the time I got there, they'd used up a thousand cassettes, you know, of just ridiculous jamming and, and you know, things just get lost. And, and it was weird. One, an interesting story I heard during the recording of that album, it was like, and early on, people were telling me the story of um, Start Me Up, right? Uh, and the story of that, it was on Tattoo You, which was a, it was not an album where they went in to record. It was an album where they, they went through some outtakes and they cobbled together an album. And the story goes that on Start Me Up, it got to take 50 by which point it had turned into a reggae song. Damp me up, stop me, da, 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 I never stop, never stop. You know, at which point it was just rejected. And when they went back, they listened to take two. And that was the version they used. Now, at the time I went, fucking hell, that's a bad producer. Who would, you know, there is a piece of brilliance there. You're looking for gold. You might, you know, and there's a big nugget there that you just throw out. But after like a month of working with them, I could understand how something could get away. But yeah. one thing I will say about Keith, he's the only person I've ever worked with. Like, you know, you're with him and, and someone says, oh, can we take a picture? Normally people smile for a picture. Keith would always go, <laughs> you know, because he'd make, he'd make him look more like Keith Richards. <laughs> yeah. He was playing the part, you yeah. know, he, and that's why he's still alive. <laughs> you know, he, he realizes Keith Richards is a brand as much as 
as much as a person, you know, and it's a bad boy rock and roll brand. And that's good, you know. I did some stuff with Lemmy a few years ago. Um, he oh. just came He came in and sung on a record that I was working on. He asked for a bottle of Jack and, and some Coke. And when he came to right. the studio, he got his glass, he poured in the smallest amount of Jack you can imagine, and then yeah. filled the rest up with his Coke. But it was all about the image of having the bottle of Jack there. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. They're smart. And he got it. He understands what Le- people Lemmy want. was brilliant, though. Lemmy was amazing. Was, was, yeah. I met him a few times with Kurt, randomly with Kirsty McColl, who was my first wife. They were great mates, you know. Oh, that's and Lemmy appeared in a couple of her videos and stuff, and uh, and he was just much. Oh, he was not your sort of. He was really intelligent and very very sharp. Uh, yeah, now yeah, lovely man, and you know, Ace of Spades is still one of the great records. I, I agree. That came out that you know, blew the blew the doors off. What a yeah. What a, yeah, what a yeah, great yeah. record. Yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. Well, let's go let's go back if you don't mind, because we jump forward to some stones. So I want to go, I want to talk a little bit about um drums and wires. In particular, obviously, the big hit. Making plans, Making for, plans Nigel. for Nigel. What was fantastic was, you know, Andy Partridge had this little drum machine with some cheesy like percussion explosions and stuff. And so, you know, we'd put those on. But what was great about XTC is the space in their music. Now, people always say, oh, that's a great sound. But a lot of people don't understand that sound is is a combination of what the parts are as well to let them breathe, you know. You always, you know, people always say, oh, the bass sound in reggae is brilliant. But that's because there is no middle, you know, and and, and there's not even any snare drum. It's like rim shot and hi-hat. So you've got all the highs, all the lows. And the only thing in the middle is a kick, you know. So with XTC, the set, you know, and, and, and it was such an easy setup. You had the two guitars panned hard left and hard right. So you had that, you had the drums across and you had, you know, and to be honest, Colin Moulding was not, you know, for him, he said, just make my bass sort of indistinct and not really, <laughs> you know, the sort of sound you would get if you were looking for a bad sound. You know, so um, <laughs> uh, so he was he was fantastic. And and, you know, Terry Chambers, I mean, again, not not a I don't think he ever realized none of them realized that they were as that they were that far ahead of the competition at the time. You know, that's very important. They didn't realize how far ahead of the competition they were. It was an easy recording. I, I remember I had this thing where I would always, I, I, I whispered, we're only making plans for Nigel. I put that on every time the, the lead voice came in, I would always, I, I whispered underneath the lead voice. And I don't even know if the band knew I did that. <laughs> but, but but you know you sort of hear, it's just this thing that's a little bit yeah, wispy yeah. In, in in the background that's amazing you know and it was a good sounding record and you know but it's the space in the in the sonic makeup that that, that allows it to be a good sound yeah so incredible offbeat guitar that uh, 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, you know going against that bass groove and it's just like a little angular kind of part that and the backing vocals, you know, yeah. even though it was Colin's song, Could be my... yeah. you know, typical yeah. Andy Partridge quirkiness. And also what was so great in those days was there was absolutely no jealousy whatsoever because Andy was definitely the alpha male, you know, as you know, it was his band. But, you know, even who wrote Life Begins at the Hop? Was that... A Colin song. A, I think that's a Colin song. But I'll check. So that was their first mini hit. And then for Andy to not have their first big hit, but there was no jealousy whatsoever. There was that, it was almost looking at it in, 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 in the way that, you know, you read about Lennon and McCartney, how one of them would write a song and the other one, that I'm going to write a better song. And there was this wonderful camaraderie that, that that comes from friendship and that you know that's truly what a great band is 
you know, a great band has no jealousy because it's like family. You know, you can be, you can say whatever you want to each other and it doesn't matter, you know. And, and so I never felt there was no jealousy that, 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 you know, Andy was the alpha male, the band leader, no question. But, but the first minor hit, Life Begins at the Hop, was Colin. The first big hit was Colin. And, and then we came in to do um, Black Sea. What was the first hit off Black Sea? Was, was that Generals and Majors? There's so many great songs on that. I, don't, I mean, the, the thing with, like, with Black Sea... It's like I I don't think of it, I don't think any of those songs as singles. I think of the whole album as being so strong. Yeah. Well, it's a much more muscular album. Yeah. It's yeah. uh you know it's it's a better album than Drums and Wires, I think. Both you great know, albums. Yeah. You argue, but yeah, I don't know. I think for me, XTC are one of those bands that you can't even you can't compare. You either like them or you don't. You buy into them or you don't buy into them. You know, there are just various sort of degrees of liking so you know i i don't like you know i don't say this song's better than that song or whatever yeah there's no point because you know i'm an xtc fan and i always will be you know well drums and wires is, is kind of the turning point isn't it because you know with white music you well, know the big difference well the big difference was barry andrews right leaving right and 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 dave gregory coming in and all of a sudden you know you you i always look at bands like a football team you know, and 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 the and how do you set up your football team? You've got your wingers, and you've got your, you know. For me, all of a sudden, you had these two great wingers. You've got these two guitars, so it was easy then to to plot your 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 how they play on the pitch. You know, because with keyboards, it's not as keyboard is a thing that you may have in stereo or blah blah blah. blah. And then where do you put the guitar? And but with two guitars. Boom, you've got your, your positioning, you've got your bass up the middle and this lovely drum sound. And, you know, Dave was a, you know, again, he just fitted in because I'm not sure if Barry Andrews even came from Swindon. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know about that. So, um, but, but, but Dave Gregory was definitely one of them. He, he was like from Swindon and just like everyone else. And, and uh, but he was never a new waiver. He was he came from the tradition of, you know, Clapton is God, you know, from that world. And he still, you know, he still plays in prog bands and, and loves his prog. And he's a, just a fantastic gentleman, you know. Incredible guitar player. Yeah. yeah, yeah, really good, really good. Probably not a sonic sculptor. You know, for him, it was about the playing rather than the sound. You know, and for me, probably... The truly great players have both. You know, when you're when you're sort of talking about, you know, who is really, you know, for me, Clapton's great, but one-dimensional because he was just a player. You know, for me, Brian May, now he can do everything. You know, he's got all that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But he can do, you know, he was a sonic sculptor. You could do Brighton well. Rock and have all of the delay stuff. Brilliant. You know, so. So just being a player for me is not... You won't get any arguments on Brian May for me. Okay. (laughs) Queen or... uh, Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, look, just quickly as a, a, you know, always it's been the Beatles, right? When you talk about the greatest bands ever. But there's an argument now that the Beatles never made anything that you could play in a stadium. The Beatles never made anything you could play at a huge sporting event. So Queen are, when you talk about the greatest bands ever, I mean, Queen are close. I would never say anyone's better than the Beatles. But there is an argument. came first, yeah. Yeah, but there's an argument right now that Queen, because of their ability to, to transcend stadiums, there's an argument that they, that they are more relevant today than the Beatles are. I mean, you're not going to get an argument from me. I mean, my, my favorite album is A Night at the Opera. But the right. um, and for all of us, like on this side of the glass, you know, for production stuff, it's... Oh, fantastic. Un- unbelievable. Uh, so you, won't, you would definitely want to get an argument from me. What was interesting, because a lot of people are, were surprised by the success of the film, and I think I was a little bit, but I wasn't actually as surprised because I was looking at the Spotify charts and they were, what, before the 
Al, before the movie came out, they were number 37 in the world. They were the number two legacy artists. They're the number two biggest artists with over 25 year career before the yeah. movie came out. And then they went boom, yeah. like into the top 10. People underestimate them it's at their peril. Yeah. At their peril. You Kids, know, my son loves them, not because yeah. of me. He just likes the songs. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, the movie was good. There's no question yeah. about it. But, you know, it wasn't truthful. It sure. wasn't, you know, they, 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 they made, you know, Queen didn't break up before Live Aid. They didn't get back together for Live Aid. You know, I mean, there's lots of little things. Uh, but they made a it. movie. They made a movie. But it was great. You know, yeah. um, I actually loved the Elton John movie purely because it was a little bit more surreal. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and it was a movie. For me, I, I if there's a documentary, I don't like docu movies. You know, I like a real documentary that is of the time. So I'm fascinated by any interview with Freddie, who is Absolutely. just. You know, I mean, he was just amazing. What a fantastic creature. Yeah, interviews with him, super shy, unless he was a little tipsy or something, quite shy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then On he the became stage. Oh. Yeah, yeah, completely, completely. And you're all music here. It's got Black Sea before Melt, but would Melt have been recorded, um, Peter Gabriel 3, before Black Sea? Uh, ask me one on sport as they would say. No, let me think. Um <laughs> I mean, why I say because I because I just think yeah. Black Sea was like uh, has the big drum sound. So I'm thinking yeah, I think of the three albums I did with you, I think uh Melt was well, it was the first time I did an album where where we had time off in between. Ah, okay. That, that makes sense. So Melt, but I'm not sure whether Black Sea was during that album. The Psychedelic Furs was definitely during that album because I remember, you know, Peter would always go off and write lyrics. I need two weeks off. I need a month, you know. So it was like p over a period of six months, that Peter's album. But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a six, you know, it was just two week blocks, you know. And, uh, and I would do the first Psychedelic Furs album during that. But I don't know whether Black Sea was done in one of those gaps. But again, you know, Black Sea was almost like a mirror. Or, you know, it was in the same room with the same team, the, uh, the same, you know. But because they were such a great band, it was, we didn't want to ever repeat the same things, you know. And I think the band didn't want that either. So it was, it was definitely XTC. But as I say, probably just a little more muscular and a little more like, you know, they had had a hit. And they and I and I had this with Dave Matthews Band on their first album, but and the second album I did with them, and they'd had a hit, you know. So you become a slightly more not cocky but more self confident because you've been proven, you know. The public have have, have given you the thumbs up. You've been on top of the pops, which you know people don't realize how important that used to be. It was huge. You know, when, it was huge. It was yeah. Thursdays. You know, <laughs> Thursdays, yes. Yep. So it was, yeah, it was just more muscular. But as a as an album, it was, um, and maybe they had a little bit better equipment. I can't really remember, but uh, but honestly, it was again two weeks, two weeks, two weeks. The songs were written. You know, I don't ever remember Andy or Colin out there going, "Just give me ten minutes to finish writing the lyrics." You know, fantastic. You know, whereas I, I, you know, my success with lots of artists like they do the phonetic singing and then write lyrics that are like the phonetics you know which Bono, David Byrne and Dave Matthews do they've never written you know they've never actually written out a po it's like singing a poem you know Stephen uh, Tyler does the same thing yeah yeah you make you just make now the difference between David Byrne and Bono is that David Byrne doesn't care if it doesn't make sense thus stop making sense it doesn't matter to him you know whereas bono it has to be in his own mind it has to make sense but it has to sound as good as the phonetic singing and it's you know oh that's a whole other things go round and round and nothing gets done you know but um but yeah no with xtc black sea again was um 
and and uh, and it felt really good. We had some hits, you know, as I say, Towers of London. We Did you ever see that uh, recording at the Manor, with the re-recording of it? Oh, God, it's like watching paint dry, the <laughs> slowest ever. <laughs> but it's so weird. It's so weird seeing yourself yeah. on film from 25 years ago, yeah. you know. I've done albums with people where they say, oh, can we just put a, put a camera up in the control room? And I'm like, no, because it's going to be this. Yeah, that was great, but you, you got to go to the B minor. <laughs> and, and yeah. then... <laughs> no, it's you know, but you know, for, for the last fifteen years, there has been so much videoing and stuff that that you, you know, you you don't even I don't think about it anymore. You know, if someone's in there while I've been in the studio, a crew of some sort, or you know, yeah, I don't think about it. So melt. Melt was done in in stages. It was done in stages. We we um, we would book the, the 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 backing track sections were done in two different. The Phil Collins tracks were done at the townhouse studio two very quickly. You know, no self control. The intruder. I think just to pause you, no self control. Depends what day it is, but in my top ten favorite songs of all time, it okay. is it's well. a such a beautiful piece of art and it's a well, pop song that, when it needs to be it's everything that, that song was built in the studio i'm guessed it might every be. single over every single sound you hear on that song was played from the beginning the drums everything was played from the beginning it was like when it came to mixing and we spent a whole day on the mix and i, I because this is like a big moment in my life it was like, okay, how do we mix this? Maybe Peter said, let's start with as little as possible. So we were like, okay, ooh, just the marimba. Great. So we did that and we, and we mixed like 20 seconds and then stopped. We worked on the second piece. Now, from the moment we, we got the second piece, Hugh left the mixing desk and went and sat at the at the at the half inch quarter inch tape quarter or half inch i can't remember so i would me and peter would sit at the desk and then work on the next piece and mainly me to be honest and we would go oh this sounds good and then let's bring the drums in here let's do this and then hugh would edit it but only on on headphones because by the, when he was editing it we were working on the next section Right. So we would do this and we never listen back to the edit because that's Hugh's job. Hugh is doing the edit and Hugh would just go like this, you know, good. So he would do the edit. We'd work on the next piece and, and, and do this, Hugh, and then, okay, Hugh, we're ready. Do the next. He'd have the headphones, do that. By nine o'clock at night after we'd had dinner and, you know, I remember bringing people in going, I think we got something. We'd never heard it, but we just felt like, you know, when we bring in that, the, the, the drum sound and all that, and it all was built up from edits. And this is where I say that Phil Collins basically took it and he took the edits and just made that into the song. You know, with Peter, it, it was built up in the studio because we had no idea that that sound would be so good coming in just at a, you know, and we listened back to it and, my only thought was, you know, because I got the volume for the play and we had it big on the loud on the big speakers because we hadn't heard it. And I want. I had the volume set for the the opening marimba <laughs> thing. By the time the end came, it was, you know, I had to turn it down. You know, you know, that thing where it gets yeah. too loud. Oh, yeah. So when in mastering, we I, I, I goosed the front up and did that. But it was really. You know, that song was built in the mix. And then it, when it comes down again, as I say, everything was um, was all the way through. It's such so, a masterpiece. It is. I, I, I'm it's really proud masterpiece. of that. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so you should be. It, uh, things like, you know, we were touching on Queen, like Bohemian Rhapsody, No Self Control. Th those are songs that you know were created in the studio, but you also know good vibrations. You know yeah. that... Oh, I listen to that all the time still. Yeah, yeah. those that, those songs that you know that they, it's the best use of the studio. 
It's yeah. the best. Yeah, 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 yeah. The studio is an instrument, I think, as a lot of people would like to it say. It is, but it, it's it's a connection between, or it's, it's when all things work in a godlike way, you know, where where the, the the everything is in sympathy with each other and the team are happy, uh, or the team are not happy. It doesn't matter. You know, I, it just works. Thank you for spending time with me and uh, and doing the first three years, years of your career. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, I'm sorry about that. Anyway, if you need more, you know where to find me. Oh, I need more. I, I'll, I'll be. All right, I'll, mate. We'll, we'll 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 set it up. But this is absolutely fantastic. Thank you, Steve. I really Good appreciate night. it. I'll speak to you soon.